We're finishing up rerouted today. The challenge has been to understand that God is very adept at stepping into our lives. If we're paying attention, if we're listening, sometimes in dramatic ways, sometimes in, in very subtle ways, God steps in and says, I've got a better idea than what you're doing right now. As far as how you're living, what you're saying, what you're doing, I've got a better idea. And gives us a fork in the road to follow. And we either do or we don't. And we're looking at the history of some people who were very sensitive to God doing that in their lives. These were the original Christians, the early Christians, right after the time of Jesus here on earth. And the ones who determined that they were all in and they were going to follow him. God uh, had their ear. <laughs> and they, they were listening carefully. For one thing, those people didn't have a Bible to read. Not in the early years. There were no Bibles. There were no seminaries. They, all they had to go on was the testimony of what they had heard with the fact that there was this man named Jesus who had lived an amazing life. He had died, rose from the dead. People saw him after he rose from the dead. And there was, there was a power that came into these people's lives that totally changed them and made life wonderful. So they believed that. Droves of people, thousands of people believed that. But in order to follow him, they had to be listening to his spirit within them and to the encouragement of, of people around them because there were no Bibles yet. That didn't come along for a, a couple hundred years. So they were attentive when God said, I got a better idea. You're going this way? I think you ought to go this way. And trust me, good things will happen. And one person in particular that that happened with was a man named Paul. He was, at the beginning, he was a sworn enemy of Jesus. He hated Jesus, was doing everything that he could. He was a, a power broker within the Jewish community, was doing everything that he could to eradicate Christianity and the followers of Jesus. He had a miraculous encounter with, with Jesus and got totally rerouted. Jesus said, once you were my enemy, now you're my best friend. <laughs> and sure enough, he became a force for Jesus and took off across the Roman Empire, planting churches. For 10 years, this sworn enemy of Jesus completely flipped around and started planting churches, planted 14 of them in 10 years over the, over the course of three different journeys that he made from Palestine up into uh, the Mediterranean world, up around the edge, the rim of the Mediterranean world. Now, as those 10 years came to a close, he could have sat back and said, that was good. I think I've done well. I'm just going to kick back now and kind of enjoy my success. He could have found some nice place where he could have been safe and secure. People would have left him alone. And he could have just presided as a bishop over this new church. But that didn't how Paul was wired up. So he's at the finish of this third, third journey that he's taken, planting churches. You can read about it in the book of Acts, starting in chapter 19. In the New Testament, Book of Acts, and he's in the uh, the city of Ephesus, and he his understanding is that he needs to return to Jerusalem for a very particular reason that God has given him. He's convinced of that. Need to go back to Jerusalem. Well, there were other people who knew him, who loved him, who cared about him, who were telling him that's a bad idea. We don't think you ought to go to Jerusalem for a variety of reasons. So he had these, this conflicting message coming. Godly, good godly people who believed in the same God he did saying, don't go, it's a bad idea. But he was convinced that God was saying, you got to go. I've got things in mind. You've, you've got to go. Now you may have that same experience in your life. If you're... Okay, let's say you're not a follower of Jesus yet. We have people here who aren't followers of Jesus. They're just curious. And you're feeling drawn to that. You're thinking maybe, maybe that's the move you want to make and, and submit to him. And people come into your life and say, what? <laughs> what? What are you thinking? That's so weird. You know, do you know, do you know how life will change? And so on it, it goes. Don't, don't do this crazy thing. And, and they like you. They love you. Or it could be that you are a follower of Jesus, but the same thing can happen. 
God is suggesting a move, a change of a fork in the road for you to take an alternate course. Maybe it's big, maybe it's little, but you've made the decision to do that, and people go, no, that's a bad idea. Sometimes they even claim to be hearing from God the same way that you do, only they're hearing something different than you're hearing. Well, what do you do with that? How do you push through or get, or get around those situations where these conflicting messages seem to be coming in? Well, looking at Paul, we can, we can get some encouragement in that and, and how to do that. All right, so Paul, he's in the city of Ephesus, which is in what we would call present-day Turkey. Turkey's in the news right now, isn't it? Ephesus, uh, an ancient city on the Mediterranean coast. It's about 57 A.D., I'm in verse 21 of chapter 19. It says, now after all these things had taken place, Paul had many adventures <laughs> in the city of Ephesus. Some of them good, some of them not so good. But it says that he was resolved to go to Jerusalem. He was going to go through Macedonia and Achaia. This would be modern day Greece. He said, after that, I must also see Rome. I wanted to go to the city of Rome. Now why in the world, when you're that close to Rome in the first place, would you go to Jerusalem to turn around and go 2,500 miles back to Rome? What's the logic in that? That's what Paul felt very compelled to do. So, goes through Greece, makes his way back south, headed for Jerusalem. We jump to Acts chapter 20, verse 16. He goes to a, a town called Miletus, which is 63 miles south of Ephesus. Didn't want to go to Ephesus for a variety of reasons. Goes to Miletus, sends for the elders in this new church that are in the city of Ephesus, this church that he planted. He said, I've, I want to say my goodbyes to you. I'll never be back. You'll never see me again. I've got important things to say. And so he did. He, he poured out his heart to them. And in the course of that, he says, I'm in verse 22 of Acts 20. He says, compelled by the Spirit, compelled by the Holy Spirit, he says, I'm going to Jerusalem without knowing what's going to happen to me there, except the Holy Spirit is warning me in town after town, every place he stops, people are telling him, Holy Spirit's telling him, imprisonment, persecutions are waiting for me. So God was telling him, Paul, you go to Jerusalem, here's what's coming. Hard times ahead. <laughs> well, when they heard these things, when he had said these things to them, they, they knelt down with him there on the beach. Before he got back on the boat, they all began to weep loudly. They hugged Paul. They kissed him, especially saddened by what he said. He said, I'm not going to see you again. Uh, bad things are about to happen. Broke their hearts. So they went to the ship and, and sent him off. Now, you've been in a situation like that probably, haven't you? A sad goodbye, somebody you're not going to see again, going off into a, a hard place, a hard time. It's heart-wrenching, heartbreaking. You might want to convince somebody not to do that. Paul takes off. Acts 21, he ends up in the city of Tyre, T-Y-R-E. It's a coastal city in Lebanon, north of Palestine. It's about 300 miles from Jerusalem. And the only reason I'm pointing out all this geography to you is to say, to nail down Again, this isn't a legend. This isn't a fairy tale. These are real dust and rock places that you can look up on a map and they exist. And there's even archaeological evidence that the, the things that they say happened here actually did happen. There is evidence of ancient Christian witness in these towns. Paul was really there. These Christians were really there in these places. So he's in the city of Tyre. And he's, he looks up all of the followers of Jesus that are there. At this point, there aren't a lot of them. It's very, very new in the Christian faith. So he stayed, they stayed there seven days. These people repeatedly told Paul, it says, through the Spirit, through the same Holy Spirit that was in them, that was in Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Don't go. He says, when our time was over, uh, they accompanied us outside the city. After kneeling down on the beach, prayed again. <laughs> They said their farewells. He moves on. He goes to the city of Caesarea. This is a coastal city that's northwest of Jerusalem. It's in Palestine. It's the home of Philip. You remember we talked about Philip two weeks ago. They had the encounter with the Ethiopian man there in, uh, in the desert. So Luke, who wrote this history, he said, I'm in verse 10 of chapter 21. While we remained there for a number of days, a prophet, ooh, a prophet by the name of Agabus, he came from Judea. And he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet up with it, and he said, okay, the Holy Spirit says this. This is the way that the Jews in Jerusalem are going to tie up the man whose belt this is. <laughs> All heads turned to Paul. It was Paul's belt. Yeah. And they're going to hand him over to the Gentiles. They're going to hand him over to the Romans. And when we heard this, when Luke, who was in Paul's entourage, and everybody else in the entourage, and the people, the believers there in Tyre, 
when they heard this, they begged him, don't go. Are you crazy? What, what are you thinking? How many times do you have to be told? It's going to be bad <laughs> when you get to Jerusalem. And so, you know, what do you do when godly friends come to you? They're hearing the same message that you're hearing as far as what's going to happen, but they interpret it completely different than what you do. That's what was going on here. And so Paul finally, he's had enough. He says, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. Stop it. <laughs> Just stop it. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm ready not only to be tied up, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And he couldn't be persuaded. They said, there's no talking to him. He's not going to change his mind. Lord's will be done. They said, don't go. Paul said, I got to go. I'm hearing something you're not hearing. Acts 25, he goes to Jerusalem. Exactly what God said would happen, happened. He goes to the temple. He's minding his own business. And he gets accused of doing something he didn't do. A riot breaks out. There's a mob that's ready to tear him limb from limb. The Roman cohort marches him, rescues him. They throw him in jail. He ends up back in the town of Caesarea with uh, uh, the governor of the whole region, the Roman governor, a man by the name, well, first it was Felix, then it was, was Festus. And Festus says to him, okay, Paul, I'm trying to figure out what to do with you. I can't figure out what you're guilty of. So how about we go back to Jerusalem and we can, we can go before these people that are so upset with you. We'll have a trial. We'll get it all settled. Maybe you'll go free. And Paul says, no, we're not going to do that. He was a Roman citizen. He said, I appeal to the highest court in the land. I appeal to Caesar. And Festus says, okay, you appeal to Caesar. To Caesar, you will go. And what happened? He punched his ticket to Rome. He's on his way, 2,500 miles up the coast, back to the city of Rome. Now, why in the world didn't Paul just go to Rome in the first place and save all the hubbub? He was up there pretty close. Why didn't he do that? Because God had something different in mind. He had opportunities in mind that would not have happened if Paul hadn't had listened to God's leading. He got to stand before the three most powerful people in Palestine and share his story and how God had stepped into his life and the difference that Jesus has made that he would never have had that opportunity otherwise if this hadn't happened. He went before Felix and Festus, two governors of Rome, and then before Agrippa, who was the king appointed by Rome. What an opportunity. Got to tell him the whole story. I was an enemy of the church. Jesus stepped into my life. Here's what it's been like. Wow, it's a powerful story. It's very compelling went clear up then finally to the city of Rome, and I don't know, it doesn't say, it could be that he got to stand before Nero himself. Who knows? Maybe so. Here's what we do know. He ended up in jail in Rome, and he writes a letter back to a church that he had planted in Greece, a church at the city of Philippi. He's writing to these people from prison. If he hadn't told you, you'd never guess he was in prison. You'd think he was in Disneyland. He's having such a great time. And here's what he writes to these people about his, his experience in, in prison in Rome. He says, I'm in Philippians, book of Philippians, New Testament, back toward the back, first chapter. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, my situation has actually turned out to advance the gospel. Who thought going to jail could be such a good thing? <laughs> The whole imperial guard, or the praetorian guard, this was the elite guard of Caesar, of the Caesar. These guys who guard me every day, and everyone else, everybody knows why I'm in prison. They know that I'm in prison for the sake of Christ. Yeah, they thought they had Paul captive. What Paul had was a captive audience. He couldn't wait for the shift change. Oh, good, here's a, here's a new soldier who gets to hear about Jesus. He was ecstatic. He says, everybody knows why I'm here, and most of the brothers and sisters having confidence in the Lord because of my imprisonment now more than ever dare to speak the word fearlessly. Yeah, there was a lot of pressure at that time against Christian people. But people saw Paul. They were encouraged by that. It gave them boldness, and they said, well, Paul can do it. We can do it too. Yeah, it's worth it. And so Paul pushed back, some, pushed back against some immense pressure on him not to go where he knew God was telling him to go. Good friends, people who loved him deeply and dearly, cared about him a lot. People who paid a lot of attention to God and what God was saying, he was able to push past that and through that to listen to the biggest voice in his head, which was God. And things happened 
that never would have happened if he had listened to his friends. Wouldn't have had these opportunities in front of these movers and shakers down there in Palestine. Wouldn't have been able to even speak to those who were in the household of the Caesar himself if he hadn't listened to God. Wow, there's a real lesson there. So I want to share a story with you now, maybe not quite as dramatic as Paul's, but an important lesson. I want to break out Jake Farrell here. He's our, our worship leader, worship minister here at Parkside. And Jake may be, I don't know, maybe kind of uh, the mystery man to us because he sings and he plays and uh, we enjoy all of that and his leadership with us, but you may not know much about him and his life and uh, how he came to be where he is, uh, sitting here on stage next to me. So, Jake Farrell, up close and personal. And uh, the first thing that I think people would like to know is, how in the world did you become a follower of Jesus in the first place? What's, what's the story with that? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I'm one of four boys, and I was raised in a house that was uh, just surrounded with God in it and Jesus, and we... Uh, grew up in a Baptist church setting, and so it wasn't like a huge come like a huge come to Jesus kind of story where I had to struggle, you know, to find this. But <clears throat> when I was about seven or eight years old, I went to a summer camp, and God had been working in my life and in my heart, um, and I accepted Him at summer camp and was baptized the following week. Um, and so it's kind of, you know, I'm surrounded by it in every aspect of my life. So grandparents both went to church with us too and uh, brothers as well so just a natural easy yeah. easy path right exactly. yeah okay yeah. so you um grew up got married became an adult uh and most recently had Objective. <laughs> yeah uh had uh, two jobs uh two yeah. part-time jobs you uh taught Science at a middle school in northern Kentucky, Villa Madonna. Good job. You were teacher of the year one year, so good on you. And uh, also had uh, the position of leading worship at the Mount Nebo United Methodist Church out in, in Bethel. So here you sit as the worship minister of Parkside. So that was a, a reroute, a pretty big reroute in your life. So how did that happen? Um, so teaching was a full-time job. And I would also, I was doing part-time worship, which I'd done worship for about 14 years. And <clears throat> when I first came into it, I didn't know much about a praise band or, or what, what, what a worship band really was. Like, I knew what a garage band was, so I could, I could relate <laughs> to that. I could relate to Metallica riffs, but, but it's a little different than, uh, you know, Bill Gaither riffs. So, um, I'm not sure he riffs. No, I don't but, know if he does either, uh, but... Um, as I started getting more and more into leading worship um, and taking it serious and what it meant as a ministry, the focus of the ministry, God just continued to put just a passion on my heart to really seek it out and to want to get better at it and want to become better at all aspects of ministry in general. And so it's really weird because teaching. I thought teaching was supposed to be my passion. I felt really comfortable with teaching. Um, and then one day, uh, I shouldn't say just one day because over the course of a couple years, I prayed to God and said, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. This is really odd to be going to school and kind of losing that passion. I love the kids and I love the teachers I worked with, but it just wasn't where I was supposed to be. Um, you mentioned the teacher of the year award and it was right after that. Like, that's really odd, I think, to tell people. I'm done. I'm done. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. Um, but it wasn't like, I'm not doing, I want, don't want to do this. Let me go find out what else I can just jump right into. It was over the course of two or three years just praying for obedience to God and that he would put faith in my heart to trust in him, uh, that he would lead me wherever it is that it was going to be. And so that's how th that switch started. It wasn't an overnight process. It was years because God works on his time, not on my time. <laughs> Even though I want him to work on my time, yeah. uh, I wanted to know right away, like, what am I doing? What am I supposed to be doing? Sometimes he's on slow time. That's right. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's really interesting to look back and see how God has had his hand in all this. Uh, a couple of years ago, my wife called me and said, 
hey, uh, we're going to babysit for one of my coworkers. Her husband is on a mission trip. He goes to this church called Parkside. We're going to babysit her three, their three boys. And I said, sure. Like, I come from a household of boys. We have a household of girls. Yes, let's do this. And um, it was Matt and Alicia Robinson. And a couple years later, and I had never met Matt before a couple years later. Um, we're sitting at Luckman's a few months ago. Talking and about a job in Parkside. Talking about a job and it's amazing how that worked. And after I had left that coffee shop, um, and it was really just uh, just to get to know each other. How you doing? It wasn't like, hey, we have a job thing going on. You called me before I even got home, and I thought, oh, he, that must have went and, well. And Matt and I did not compare notes. I did not know Matt had called you. Or... Matt, I don't think you knew I was completely meeting with Matt at that time too. No. So it's pretty uh -uh. amazing to see how God stepped in and put things in motion and just the preparation that he's put me through all the years. Um, he put it on my heart, but the timing wasn't right uh, for him. And so I continued to want to get better and feel the passion. Yeah. So did you get any, any pushback or any skepticism or just confusion? People going, you're going you're gonna to do what and why? Well, I think naturally it's odd to tell somebody you're, you're leaving, you know, Teaching with all the teachers, they saw how I was with the kids and uh, in the classroom, and I really enjoyed it. But just to be like, I'm not doing that anymore, and people were confused, and uh, some, you know, most of them were supportive, but some of them were like, "Is that even a real job?" Like, <laughs> like and most people outside of this setting think that a worship minister is a person who stands on stage and preaches all the time, and I said, "That's not it." So. Um, but yeah, it was, it's hard to have that conversation with your friends, um, that you, your coworkers that you work with, to say, I mean, uh, especially the kids, to say, you know, I love being around you guys, but I'm not supposed to be teaching anymore. And I know it's really weird to hear. It's a weird thing to a process to, to say, I feel like God's leading me somewhere else, and I want to be obedient to Him. Um, so whatever it is, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's not like you were way off track, and. Uh, yeah, chasing windmills or involved in a lot of stuff very contrary you, to God, you were doing good stuff. I mean, teaching, that's a noble profession. What's better than pouring into the lives of kids and uh, leading worship at, a, at another church? You know, kind of best of two worlds. And, and, but God said it could be even better. So here you are with us, and we're glad. So, yeah, I'm very thankful that God worked that out, that out for us. Yeah, my wife and I, we prayed about this over and over, and, and just the fact that we're here at Parkside, we just feel extremely blessed that this is where God has led us. Um, and it has been a seamless kind of transition, which is uh, just kind of you can see God's hand in it. Yeah, cool. All right, well, we'll hear from you again in just a few minutes. Yeah, so there's some, there's some takeaways here from the experience of, of Paul, the experience of Jake. As far as, well, I guess the first point to make is maybe I've, I've made it sound like a reroute in life is go, always going to be perfectly dreadful. <laughs> this is going to be dangerous and risky and full of pain. Not necessarily. Uh, sometimes it's finding the sweet spot that God has had in mind for you and life has been kind of stressful otherwise because you've been out of sync. You're just not in the path that God says, this is really the best place, not only for you, but for me, for both of us. This is the better way. So it can, suddenly life can smooth out when, when you hit that place that God has in mind. But there's no doubt that sometimes it is hard. There's risk. Sometimes there are losses in life. Especially if you haven't been following Jesus and you make that determination and you submit to him, man, it turns life completely around. And some of that can be hard. And so God is honest about that. He's never promised anything other than that. Yeah, in this life you'll have tribulation, <laughs> Jesus said, because it, it kind of goes against the grain of some things. So just be ready for that. Paul wasn't being warned off of going to Jerusalem. God was just obviously saying, get ready. Here it comes. Oftentimes, the roughest road can lead to the greatest good, to where you say, ah, ah, you know, the, the journey was, was pretty rugged along the way, but when you look at what the outcome has been, you go, it was well worth it. Oh, it was well worth whatever I went through to see, yeah, God did know best. He really did know best. 
The other thing to understand is that, and again, this is clear from teaching in the Bible, and that is that God's goal is never our comfort and personal safety. That is not his ultimate goal for us. God's ultimate goal is the accomplishment of his will in this world, bringing suitable attention to himself so that people can find life with him and so that we can walk in a deeper and closer relationship with him. That's his goal for us. So we got to be discerning when we listen to the counsel of other people, when God says, all right, here it is, fork in the road, go right instead of left, and people begin to push back. Now, again, if it's a decision to come to Jesus in the first place, you have unbelieving friends who aren't going to understand that. They're not bad people. They love you, they care about you, and they like you just the way that you are. And they're afraid you're going to go weird on them. <laughs> and there may, there may be some weird aspects to that, but you're so much fun. We want you to stay that way. And so they're fearful for you and, and concerned for you, but there are things they just can't understand. Now, you may even meet some hostility. There may be people who are just hostile to the whole Jesus thing, but that, that can be part of it too. But they're, they're just things they don't understand. So we need to understand that. There are our good godly people, good friends who know Jesus, who love him, who are, who are, you know, familiar with the scriptures, and they come and they say, this is a bad decision. You shouldn't be doing this. When we're very convinced that God is saying we should be doing this. How do you push through that? What do you do with that? And I know, I know what that's like from, from both ends, really, but... You know, I want to make sure, I've always wanted to make sure I'm not one of those people that knows Jesus, but that I'm one of those roadblocks to someone who's wanting to follow Jesus, and I throw up a barrier of some kind, and it happened with our own kids. When, uh, when our daughter came to us and said, I mean, I've been making mission trips all my life, all my adult life, and my daughter comes to, to us, Marilyn and I, and says, I'm going to Calcutta, India, and I'm going to work in the red light district in Calcutta, with young girls who are being abused. And in my head, I'm screaming, what? Don't do that. And all the things that come to mind, I love you, that's dangerous, that's the worst place in the world, I can, on and on it goes. Thankfully, I didn't say that out loud. <laughs> but I was thinking it. Our son, Zach, the same way. He spent time in, in La Paz, Bolivia, Finally came back, so glad to have him back home. He bought a house. I thought, oh, good, he bought a house now. Now he's locked in. He's got a mortgage. And uh, he got married to a local girl. Yes, he's bolted down now. There's to be no more leaving home, leaving town. And he invites Marilyn and I to Caribou, and he says, I'm going back to La Paz. And I didn't say what I was thinking. I, I broke down and started crying. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, it goes both ways. We want to listen to what God is telling us to do, but we don't want to be that person that stands in the way of what God is telling somebody else to do. And so, yeah, I would cry like a baby when we go to the airport. There was a time in my life I hated airports. I hated those goodbyes. But ultimately I see, wow, what a wonder God has worked in our family through kids who listen to God more than they paid attention to the tears in our eyes. So, yeah. We're listening to an audience of one. If we're really locked in, if we're really serious about following Jesus, we're listening to an audience of one, and that's God, and we care far more about what he thinks and are listening more carefully to what he's telling us that comes through the spiritual intuition of his spirit within us, that comes through what we can read very directly in the documents that preserve his thoughts and, and, and his will and intentions for us in the Bible. It's all there for us. And through good, good godly counsel and, and encouragement that comes from the people around us. I'm not saying beware of your godly friends when you're trying to follow God. No, we can give each other great counsel if we're all too tuned in in the right way. The people in, the, in that first century, when, when the church was first established, those people didn't know what in the world they were doing. There were no seminaries. Nobody went to a seminary. Nobody had in-depth teaching. There were no Bibles. For a couple hundred years, there were no Bibles to read. 
All they had was the testimony of people who had been in, in Jerusalem and said, Jesus died for our sins, he was buried, he rose from the dead and was seen. That's what we know. And we know that powerful things came about through that, and he's changed our lives. That's what we know. And they found that testimony credible. And they couldn't do anything but share that testimony with others, and they experienced the power of God in their lives and saw how Jesus can change life in a wonderful way if you trust him with your life. If you trust him as the one who knows better than anybody else what life is all about and the very best direction that your life can go. That's all they knew. And they were soft and they were attentive and they said, okay, you say go, we go. And you say, you tell us where, and that's where we're headed. That's what they did for hundreds of years until this fledgling group of followers finally overwhelmed the Roman Empire in three centuries, which wasn't all good, but mostly good. It was amazing. The same thing can continue to happen today, and I can tell you it's happened in my life. I don't have these miraculous things happen. I don't hear voices in my head. I don't. I can't point to something and say, that is truly miraculous, where God directed me from here to there. I don't have anything quite like that, but there is a strong, subtle, very clear hand of God in my life. When I look back over the course of things and say, there he is, and he's not silent, and he knows what he's doing, and he can be trusted, and life is good. Life is good. <laughs> it just is. So, if any of this has struck a chord with you at all in any way, if you're struggling with, I don't know about Jesus, I just, I just don't know. There's an awful lot of this that's hard to swallow and hard to believe. I'd like to talk more about it. I'd love to talk to you just to share what I know about Jesus and let, let God kind of step into the conversation too. I'd love to have that conversation with you. But maybe you're a follower of Jesus and have been, but you've kind of been playing it safe, out on the edge, not getting too crazy with anything, just playing it safe. And you know God is saying, how about you go here? How about over here? And you're not sure what to do with that. I'd love to have that conversation with you as well. It's not always a big thing. It's not always a huge thing. Sometimes it's a very small thing. It's very, a very gentle course correction, which can lead to an entirely different destination in life. I'd love to talk to you about that. Write it down on, on there's cards in there in front of you. Write it down. Leave it at the table in the back when you leave, but let's, let's talk. So we're going to finish up this morning by singing a declaration of God. You know, I guess I'm in the mode of explaining why we do what we do here this morning. Why do we sing songs at the close of the service? Because it's awkward not to. <laughs> it's awkward to say, okay, we're done. You can leave. That's just, that's so abrupt. Yeah, but there's a better reason than that. The better reason is, you know, you, we, we sing these songs, these wonderful emotional songs, and, and we, we hear this encouraging word from God and stuff stirring around with us. What do I do with that? It's nice to be able to stand in unison and say, God, here's something we want to declare to you, and what better way to do it than through beautiful music to do that? People have done that for centuries. So that's how we're going to finish up this morning, by making a beautiful declaration to God to say, this has been good, and it's good to be with you. So let's stand. And let's sing. <laughs>